In the past year, 2013, the Jewish family lost many precious souls, some of them household names, many less well known, yet each of them made special contributions of their own and touched the lives of many of us. And so as we close out the year together, we pay tribute to many of them in this moment of sacred memory. As always, we begin by remembering a number of revered rabbis. Rabbi Abraham B. Hecht, who helped build the largest Sephardic congregation in North America, Congregation Sherry Zion in Brooklyn, New York, where he served for more than 40 years. Rabbi Hecht was also the controversial president of the Rabbinical Alliance of America, halachically endorsing the assassination of Israeli officials who promoted the Oslo Accords and giving up parts of Eretz Yisrael in a peace agreement. After the assassination of Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, Rabbi Hecht was put on a six-month leave of absence from his congregation and was barred from entering the State of Israel. Rabbi Hecht concluded his rabbinic career in the Norwalk congregation of Beth Israel. And on a personal note, he was for many years a frequent guest on L'Chaim. Rabbi Philip Berg, founder of Kabbalah Center International, who put a modern spin on Kabbalah, which attracted celebrities such as Madonna, Demi Moore, and Britney Spears. Rabbi Yehoshua Neuwirth, an Orthodox rabbi in Israel, who authored one of the most definitive and original halakhic guides on the Shabbat, entitled Sabbath Observance According to Jewish Law. Rabbi Menachem Froman, a chief rabbi of the West Bank settlement of Tekoa and a unique voice in the settler community as a leading proponent of Israeli-Palestinian dialogue as far back as the 1980s when contact with the PLO was still illegal. Rabbi Avraham Branwin, a descendant of the Magid of Mezrich, Elimelech of Lizhensk, and Levi Yitzchak of Verdichev, serving in the artillery unit of the Israeli Defense Forces, Rabbi Branwin was among the soldiers who crossed the Suez Canal into Egypt during the Yom Kippur War of 1973. Rabbi Ovadia Yosef, one of the most important figures on the world Jewish scene, who served as the Sephardi Chief Rabbi of Israel from 1973 to 1983 and was the leader of the ultra-Orthodox Shas Party in the Knesset. The Iraqi-born Rabbi Yosef was an esteemed Talmud scholar and an authority on Jewish law, and in 1970 he was awarded the prestigious Israel Prize for Rabbinic Literature. And Rabbi Yaakov Yosef, the second son, of Rabbi Ovadia Yosef, who, like his father, also served as a member of the Shas party in the Israeli Knesset and was the head of the Hazon Yaakov Yeshiva in Jerusalem. Rabbi Herschel Schachter, one of the most beloved of all American Orthodox rabbis, who served this country as a chaplain in the Third Army during World War II and was the first U.S. Army chaplain to enter Buchenwald on April 11, 1945, barely an hour after the Nazi concentration camp had been liberated by General Patton. Rabbi Schachter remained at Buchenwald for months and was responsible for personally rescuing a seven-year-old child named Yisrael Meir Lau, who grew up to be the Ashkenazi chief rabbi of Israel. Rabbi Schachter also aided in the resettlement of a teenager named Elie Wiesel. And after the war, Rabbi Herschel Schachter served as the rabbi of the Mashalu Jewish Center in the Bronx from 1947 till it closed in 1999 and was a former chairman of the Conference of Presidents of major American Jewish organizations. And Rabbi David Hartman, the brilliant and charismatic Brooklyn-born Jewish philosopher who was a student and disciple of Rav Joseph Soloveitchik at Yeshiva University, who earned a doctorate in philosophy from Fordham University, 
served as an Orthodox rabbi in Montreal, Canada, and made Aliyah in 1971 and founded the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem, where he inspired an entire generation of rabbis and Jewish educators devoted to a synthesis of Jewish tradition and modern Jewish pluralism. A prolific writer, David Hartman evolved from what he called a defender of halakha, traditional Jewish law, to a critic of Orthodox Judaism's reluctance to permit halakha to grow and evolve. A most inspiring teacher, my meeting with him on Lachayim remains one of my most treasured moments. I want to tell you, sometimes it's lonely. <laughs> It's lonely because I, I sometimes feel that what I'm listening to, many Jews find difficult to hear. And I'm looking for other Jews to stand with in Sinai, mm -hmm. for, me, for them to appreciate the invitation and the joy on the part of God for me to become responsible. From the professional fields of law, government, science, and medicine, Howard Grief, a Jerusalem attorney born in Montreal, Canada, who became an expert in international law as it applies to all the land designated for the Jewish people under the San Remo Peace Conference of 1920. In 1999, we've petitioned the Israeli Supreme Court to annul the Oslo Accords. The court refused to consider his petition on the grounds that it was politically motivated. William H. Ginsburg, a medical malpractice attorney who rose to national prominence as Monica Lewinsky's lawyer. William Ginsburg also represented the physician accused of covering up the cause of Liberace's death from AIDS. Gustav Reines, a professor of economics at Yale who served the World Bank and the Rockefeller Foundation, assisting developing countries throughout his career. Dr. Jack Fishman, a professor at Yeshiva University's Albert Einstein College of Medicine who helped develop Naloxone, a powerful medication that has saved countless people from fatal overdoses of heroin and other narcotics. Professor Leo Sachs, a professor at Israel's Weizmann Institute of Science and one of Israel's first scientists in the field of genetics. Sachs's research on the use of amniotic fluid to diagnose a fetus's genetic properties forms the basis for today's prenatal diagnosis of many human diseases. As for his contributions to the world, Leo Sachs was awarded the Israel Prize in Science in 1972. Abraham Nemeth, who, blind from infancy, created the Nemeth Code, a form of Braille that enables the visually impaired to study and to excel in science, technology, engineering, and complex mathematics. And throughout his life, Abraham Nemeth dedicated much of his spare time to creating Braille versions of Jewish texts. Dr. Benjamin Bethel Milstein, a British surgeon who pioneered heart surgery procedures and early attempts at heart transplants. William Pollock, a medical researcher who helped develop a vaccine that eradicated the RH disease, once responsible for 10,000 infant deaths a year. In 1980, William Pollock and his colleagues received the Lesker Award, often referred to as the American Nobel Prize. Nobel laureate Robert William Fogel, an American economic historian and scientist who pioneered the use of cleometrics, which applies economic theory and statistics to the study of history. In 1993, Robert Fogel was a co-recipient of the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences. Nobel laureate Lawrence Klein, a professor of economics at the University of Pennsylvania, who predicted America's economic boom after World War II, when most were expecting another depression. In 1980, Lawrence Klein was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economic Science for developing statistical models that are used to analyze and predict global economic trends. Nobel laureate Donald A. Glazer, 
an American physicist and neurobiologist who won the 1960 Nobel Prize in Physics for his invention of the bubble chamber used in subatomic particle physics at the age of 26, an invention which proved his most famous skeptic, Enrico Fermi, wrong. Later in life, Donald Glaser turned his attention to microbiology, where he worked to develop cancer therapies. Leonard Garment, who may be most remembered for his years as White House counsel during the tumultuous days of Watergate as a staunch defender of President Richard Nixon. For many Israelis and American Jews, however, Leonard Garment was known as our man in the White House, being a personal friend of Golda Meir, who helped persuade President Nixon to override the Defense and State Department's objections and to supply Israel with phantom jets that were crucial in Israel's survival during the Yom Kippur War of 1973. Dr. Harry Romanowitz, fondly known as Hesh by everyone who knew and loved him, who served as Chief of Pediatrics at Stanford Hospital for two decades and sat on the faculties of both Yale and Columbia's medical schools. The son of Holocaust survivors, Hesh Romanowitz was also instrumental in promoting Holocaust studies, was a devotee of the Yiddish language and a supporter of the National Yiddish Theater Folkspina, often appearing on Shalom TV. Shalom Aleichem. Huh? Shalom Aleichem. Aleichem Shalom, Avada. Yichais Hesh Romanovich. Hesh Romanovich was in Ohev Yisrael in the finest sense of the phrase, a true lover of Israel whose entire life reflected his love of Jewish tradition and embodied the values of Menschlichkeit. But to be sure, Hesh Romanowitz will forever be best and most lovingly remembered for traveling the world as a supreme, talented moyo, performing ritual circumcisions. And Hesh Romanowitz was the moyo for both my son Ari and my grandson Aaron. Dr. Joyce Brothers, a beloved television and radio psychologist who first gained national attention in 1955 when she became the only woman ever to win the $64,000 question, answering queries in the category of boxing. For more than 50 years, Dr. Brothers also wrote her own advice column, which appeared in newspapers throughout the country. From the world of business, Jack Singer, a Canadian businessman, philanthropist, and real estate developer who helped Los Angeles revitalize its Hollywood district and helped establish the Hollywood Center Studio as a world-class resource for feature film and commercial production. Paul Rachman, a Canadian real estate developer who made and lost billions of dollars while transforming the skylines of Toronto, New York, and London. Dov Lautman, an Israeli entrepreneur who was a tireless advocate of coexistence between Jews and Arabs. Dov Lautman was one of the founders of Dor Shalom, the Rabin Center, and the Perez Peace Center. And in 2007, he was awarded the Israel Prize for Lifetime Achievement. Peter B. Lewis, chairman of the Progressive Insurance Company, who, by focusing on high-risk drivers, grew the company to become the third largest auto insurance company in the United States. A noted philanthropist, in 2012, Lewis signed the Giving Pledge, promising to give at least half his wealth to charity. Lillian Kahn, who in 1961, with her husband Miles, founded the Coach Leatherware Company, which by the 1980s, was selling about $20 million in handbags every year. Muriel Siebert, known as Mickey, was the most successful woman's rights activist, becoming the first woman to own a seat on the New York Stock Exchange, as well as the first woman to own a brokerage firm, Muriel Siebert & Company. Muriel Siebert then became the first female superintendent of banking for New York State, and director of New York City's Municipal Credit Union. Muriel donated millions of dollars from her own brokerage and securities firms 
to help other women get their start in business and finance. Catherine Wasserman Davis, who at the age of 100 founded the Davis Projects for Peace, which awarded $10,000 grants to college students engaged in humanitarian efforts around the world. During her lifetime, Catherine Davis contributed tens of millions of dollars to cleaning New York's Hudson River. Catherine Wasserman died this past April, still active at the age of 106. David Gold, an American businessman who established the 99 cents only chain of discount stores, an idea family and friends thought ridiculous until it grew into a publicly traded company on the New York Stock Exchange. Alan Abelson, a veteran financial journalist and longtime writer of the influential Up and Down Wall Street column in Barron's Magazine, where he was editor for 11 years. Samuel Sam Farber, an American industrial designer and businessman who with his son John Farber co-founded OXO, a manufacturer of kitchen utensils and housewares which revolutionized the kitchenware industry with a line of utensils of plastic coated black handles. Mark Rich, the international financier and businessman who became one of history's most successful commodities traders. After being indicted on charges of tax evasion and involved with illegal dealings with Iran, Rich fled to Switzerland. Known as a major donor to the Democratic Party, he was famously pardoned by Bill Clinton during the president's last hours in office. From the worlds of literature, culture, sports and entertainment, Tzvi Yavetz, who, after escaping the Holocaust, served in the underground Palmach in Palestine in opposition to the British. The Ukrainian-born Yavetz became one of Israel's most esteemed historians and processors of ancient history at Tel Aviv University. And in 1990, he was awarded the Israel Prize for Humanities. Sarah Braverman, known as Surika, was one of the first women to join the Palmach the elite arm of the Haganah, and founded the IDF Women's Army Corps. During World War II, she was one of a select group of 37 volunteers who parachuted into Nazi-controlled territory. For her efforts to save Jews during the Holocaust, Sarika was given the honor of lighting a torch on Israel's 62nd Independence Day. Israel Gutman, who took part in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, and survived three Nazi concentration camps to document Nazi atrocities he witnessed. As editor of the Encyclopedia of the Holocaust, a monumental four-volume collection of scholarly work, Israel Gutman helped found the International Institute for Holocaust Research at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. Yosef Harish, a former Israeli Attorney General and a judge involved in several notorious cases, including Bus 300 Affair, where Shin Bet members executed two Palestinian hijackers. Harish was also involved in the trial of John Demanyuk and the deportation of 418 Hamas operatives to Lebanon in 1993. During his term as Attorney General, Harish prohibited political appointments in civil service and required that a disciplinary hearing be held before any indictment was issued. Joe Benkow, born Joseph Elias Benkowitz, a Norwegian politician and the first and only Jewish president of Norway's parliament. Benkow was recognized for his constant battle against Scandinavian anti-Semitism and anti-Israel sentiments. Pete Hoffman, who created the syndicated comic strip Jeff Cobb and illustrated the syndicated panel Why We Say, which ran in more than 100 newspapers in North America, South America, and Europe. Bertram Stern, a commercial photographer who helped redefine advertising and fashion arts in the 1950s and 60s, and who's best known for his raw and poignant photos of Marilyn Monroe, taken for Vogue 
six weeks before her death. J. Conrad Levinson, recognized as the father of guerrilla marketing, who helped turn Charlie the Tuna, the Pillsbury Doughboy, and the Marlboro Man into household names and brands. Ze'ev Ben Chaim, an award-winning Israeli linguist who passed away at the age of 106. Ben Chaim served as the second president of the Academy of the Hebrew Language and founded the Historical Dictionary Academy. Ben Chaim was awarded both the prestigious Israel Prize for Jewish Studies and the Rothschild Prize. Harvey Shapiro, an American poet and author of a dozen books that examine what it means to exist in this world as a man, a husband, a father, and as a Jew. Harvey Shapiro became a New York Times editor for both the New York Times Magazine and the Times Book Review. Daniel Hoffman, America's Poet Laureate in 1973 and 74, whose books include a collection of sonnets, an epic poem about the founding of Pennsylvania, and analytical works about Paul Bunyan and Edgar Allan Poe. Al Goldstein, the controversial publisher of Screw magazine and an ardent defender of free speech who pushed hardcore pornography into the cultural mainstream. Herbert Mitgang, author, historian, journalist, and playwright who had a distinguished 47-year career at the New York Times, including years as a member of the editorial board where he helped create the New York Times op-ed page. Mitgang wrote or edited 15 works of fiction and nonfiction, including two books on Abraham Lincoln. Peter Kaplan, editor of the New York Observer for 15 years, who chronicled every move made by cities, movers, and shakers. Prior to the Observer, Peter was a reporter at the Times, the executive editor of the business magazine Manhattan Inc., and the executive producer of Charlie Rose's PBS talk show. Solomon Saul Urich, an American novelist, most well known for his 1965 novel, The Warriors, which became a cult movie of the same name in 1979. In his novel, Urich recast an ancient Greek battle as a tale of warring New York street gangs. Before the publication of The Warriors, Mr. Urich worked for many years as an investigator for the New York City Department of Welfare and based several more of his novels on his experiences in the department. Hugh Nissenson, an author whose books were journeys that often explored religion, particularly Judaism. His book, The Tree of Life, was a finalist for the National Book Award. One of the things that strikes me every time I am there is to realize that this is a vital, extraordinary, creative, anguished society which has been and is at war for 40 years. Charlotte Zolotow, a distinguished author and editor of wonderful books for children, dealing with such weighty subjects as anger, envy, and death. Zolotow, who wrote more than 70 children's picture books, is remembered through the Charlotte Zolotow Award given annually to the author of the best picture book published in the United States. Esther Street Wurzel, who wrote more than 25 children's books and won several prestigious prizes, including the Zionist Congress Award and the Prime Minister's Prize for Creative Work. Deborah Omer, renowned Israeli author of nearly 100 children's books, for which she was awarded the Israel Prize for Literature. Elaine Lobel Konigsberg, an American writer and illustrator of children's books and young adult fiction, and one of only five writers to win two Newbery Medals, the Venerable American Library Association Award for the year's most distinguished contribution to American children's literature. Dorothy Taubman, an American music teacher who developed the Taubman approach to piano playing based on an analysis of the motions needed for musical expression, techniques which have been adapted to computer keyboard typing as well. Herb Kaplow, 
longtime Washington correspondent for NBC and ABC News, whose resonant voice and craggy face were familiar to generations of viewers of the nightly news broadcasts. Kaplow covered the Nuremberg trials, the Cuban Revolution, and the Civil Rights Movement, and reported extensively on the United States space program. As White House correspondent, Kaplow also covered 10 presidential campaigns and traveled with President Richard Nixon on his groundbreaking trip to China. Anthony Lewis, a New York Times reporter and columnist whose work earned him two Pulitzer Prizes and transformed American legal journalism. His column called At Home Abroad appeared on the op-ed page of the New York Times for more than 30 years with a liberal, learned, conversational, and direct voice. Pauline Phillips, known for her much publicized professional rivalry with her identical twin sister, Epi Lederer, who became famous under her advice column pen name, Anne Landers. Pauline Phillips ultimately transformed herself into a syndicated advice columnist as well, known to tens of millions by her column's name, Dear Abby. Bill Mazur, known as The Amazing for his encyclopedic recall of sports trivia, who became perhaps the single most important figure in the creation of sports talk radio. Bill was also a superb play-by-play -play announcer as well, covering New York sports for decades and ultimately spending more than 60 years in broadcasting. A Jew with a rich Orthodox yeshiva background, Bill Mazur was also one of the sweetest and most gentle human beings to have graced this world. And his meeting with me on the Chaim fulfilled a childhood dream. I'm Jewish. I mean, I thought it was great. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had to point out the fact that uh, my relatives and kinfolk had produced some of the greatest people in the history of the world. and from the world of the arts. Zerarira Harafal, an Israeli film, stage, and television actress, and a 2003 recipient of the Israel Prize in theater. Sefi Rivlin, one of Israel's leading comedians and actors, who received the 2002 Golden Mask Prize for Lifetime Achievement, and the 2009 Israeli Academy of Film and Television Lifetime Achievement Award. Michael Winner, English film director and producer, and a restaurant critic for the Sunday Times. His column was called Winner's Dinners. He became more well known for his action movies, especially the violent Death Wish series that starred Charles Bronson. Stanley Carnow, a newspaper journalist best known for his books and documentaries about Vietnam and the Philippines, in the throes of war and upheaval, which were the basis of the 13-hour PBS documentary, Vietnam, A Television History, which won six Emmy Awards and a Peabody. His 1989 book, In Our Image, America's Empire in the Philippines, won Carnow the 1990 Pulitzer Prize for History. Bonnie Franklin, the pert redhead actress who won fame as a divorced mom on the long-running American television sitcom, one Day at a Time, for which she was nominated for an Emmy and two Golden Globe Awards. Fran Warren, singer and actress whose 1947 recording of A Sunday Kind of Love became a classic of the big band era. Malachi Throne, one of America's busiest character actors for half a century, having appeared in such television series as Perry Mason, The Man from Uncle, Mr. Novak, Ben Casey, and more recently, The West Wing and the hit film Catch Me If You Can. Faye Cannon, an Oscar-nominated and Emmy-winning screenwriter who served four terms as president of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Regina Resnick, an opera star who made her debut at the New Opera Company of New York in 1942. Over the years, she performed many of opera's most important roles on its most 
prominent stages. Shirley Hers, the legendary theater press agent whose career covered 65 years, from the days of planting blurbs in Walter Winchell's newspaper column to the television and internet eras. Hers received a Tony Award for Excellence in 2009, and when she passed away this August, Broadway dimmed its lights in her honor. Sid Bernstein, the soft-spoken impresario best known for bringing the Beatles to Carnegie Hall in 1964 and to Shea Stadium in 1965. Bernstein also presented the Rolling Stones in the Kingston concert and the Animals at the Paramount Theater in Times Square. Ted Post, a director who collaborated with Clint Eastwood on two hit films, directed hundreds of episodes of television series like Gunsmoke, Peyton Place, and Rawhide, and made a low-budget film, Go Tell the Spartans, about the Vietnam War that was widely ignored when it was released in 1978, but which is now regarded by many critics as one of the best in its genre. Herbert Blau, a theater director who helped start the Actors Workshop in San Francisco in 1952, which grew into a vibrant theater company known for its feisty experimentalism. Elroy Schwartz, an American comedy and television writer who wrote for some of the best-known comedians of the era, including Lucille Ball, Groucho Marx, and Bob Hope. Schwartz was also one of the head writers for Gilligan's Island, a CBS sitcom which was created by his late brother, Sherwood Schwartz. Fred Katz, a musician, composer, and educator who helped to introduce the cello to jazz. In 1959, his landmark album, Folk Songs for Far Out Folk, was a richly orchestrated mix of Hebraic melodies with American and African folk music. Murray Gershens, who had a record store in Los Angeles called Music Man Murray, where he sold his 400,000 records. In his later years, he went into show business, starting with a bit part on Will and & Grace, and in films as well as TV shows like Parks and Rec and Mad Men. Sid Field, an American screenwriting guru who wrote several books on the subject of screenwriting, and whose screenplay guidelines are used by Hollywood writers to this day. Stanley Kaufman, the critic, author, and editor who reviewed movies for The New Republic for more than 50 years, becoming one of the oldest working critics in history. Kaufman helped discover the classic novels Fahrenheit 451 and The Moviegoer, and received an Emmy in 1964 for his commentary on WNET-TV and the Polk Award for his film Criticism in 1982. Michael Mickey Rose, an American comedy writer and screenwriter who was a lifetime friend of Woody Allen and who helped write Allen's stand-up routines and several of his early motion pictures. Eric Einstein, an Israeli superstar not terribly well known outside of Israel, but truly one of Israel's most beloved and greatest of singers and songwriters, who last year was voted best Israeli singer of all time. Einstein's music was a unique blend of folk and rock that helped shape a new Hebrew popular culture, which crossed generations and ethnic boundaries, while the embodiment of an older, more genteel Israel. Announcing Mr. Einstein's death, the director of the Tel Aviv Medical Center said simply, there will be no one to sing for us anymore. And many who eulogized Einstein described him as the soundtrack of the nation Israel. Lou Reed, a rock and roll pioneer and a New York legend as a singer, songwriter, and leader of the rock band, The Velvet Underground often cited as one of the most important and influential rock groups of the 1960s that helped shape American rock and roll. Lou Reed's hits included Walk on the Wild Side, Perfect Day, Sweet Jane, and Satellite of Love. And Lou Reed was elected to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. 
Gary David Goldberg, the award-winning television writer and producer who created warm-hearted television shows, most notably Family Ties, which turned Michael J. Fox into a star. Gary, who started his career while living in Israel in 1972, received Emmy Awards for both Lou Grant and Family Ties, as well as four Writers Guild of America Awards. Edie Gourmet, the lovable recording and concert superstar who, with her husband Steve Lawrence, made an indelible impression on American audiences during the 1960s. Of her many hits, her biggest was her 1963 release, Blame It on the Bossa Nova, and Edie won a Grammy Award for Best Female Vocal Performance for her 1967 version of If He Walked Into My Life from Mame. During their illustrious career, Edie Gourmet and Steve Lawrence recorded 93 albums and won 12 Emmys and two Grammys. Hanam Lotek, the beloved first lady of Yiddish music whose collections preserve the joyful and mournful melodies of the shtetl and who helped preserve Yiddish theater in America, for which her son Zalman Lotek now serves as artistic director of the National Yiddish Theater Folkspina, while her son Mark serves as the president of Folkspina's board of directors. For more than 43 years, Hanam Lotek and her late husband Joseph wrote a column entitled Pearls of Yiddish Poetry for the Forward's Yiddish Edition, and she published three Yiddish songbooks while serving as archivist at YIVO for 65 years. Hannah's meticulous investigation into Yiddish folk songs were crucial in the revival of klezmer music and caused Nobel laureate Isaac Basheva Singer to refer to Hannah as the Sherlock Holmes of Yiddish song. Evelyn Kozak, whose family fled Russia to escape anti-Semitism in the 1880s and who died this past November at the age of 113, making Evelyn Kozak at the time of her passing the world's oldest documented Jew and the world's seventh oldest person. Frank Lautenberg, a successful businessman who became a legendary figure in New Jersey politics, serving as New Jersey's Democratic Senator for some 20 years over two separate 10-year terms. And Senator Lautenberg was a sitting U.S. Senator when he passed away this year. Frank Lautenberg, who had the distinction of being the last veteran of World War II to serve in the United States Senate, was also known as the last of the New Deal liberals and was responsible for legislation against drug driving, for the environment and consumer protection, and in support of Amtrak and public transportation. A deeply committed Jew, passionate about the state of Israel, Frank Lautenberg served as the top lay leader for United Jewish Appeal in the 1970s, the youngest person ever to be appointed to that position and he served on the governing boards of the American Jewish Committee and Hebrew University. And Frank Lautenberg is credited for having inspired Jews of the 1970s to become involved in the movement to save Soviet Jewry and to be more involved with the Jewish people and Jewish values. Edgar Bronfman, the billionaire businessman and philanthropist who so expanded his family's liquor-based empire, the Seagram Company, that one out of every three distilled alcoholic drinks in the United States was a Seagram's product. But it was Edgar Bronfman's commitment to the Jewish future which gave him a stature unparalleled in our time. As president of the World Jewish Congress, Bronfman turned a loose federation of Jewish groups in 66 disparate countries into a focused organization able to better champion the rights of Jews everywhere. Under his leadership, the Congress pressed the Soviet Union to improve conditions for Jews living in their country and to allow freer immigration, led the efforts to expose the hidden Nazi past of Kurt Waldheim, 
the former Secretary General of the UN, and campaigned successfully to force Swiss banks to make restitutions of more than a billion dollars to the relatives of German Holocaust victims who had deposited their savings in Switzerland before World War II. A major Jewish philanthropist, Bronfman was especially committed to Jewish education and to social programs in the United States and Israel. And at NYU, he established the Edgar M. Bronfman Center for Jewish Life. And in 1999, President Clinton presented him with the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And the mayor, Edward Irving Koch, the colorful, beloved three-term mayor of the city of New York, who led the city from fiscal insolvency to economic boom from 1978 to 1989. Known to ride the subways and stand at street corners greeting passerbys with the slogan, How am I doing? Koch, a lifelong Democrat, described himself as a liberal with sanity. He began as a congressman for New York's Upper East Side, the Silk Stocking District, serving in Washington for four terms. After his service as mayor, Ed Koch enjoyed a series of other successful careers as an American lawyer, politician, political commentator, television judge, even as a movie critic here on Shalom TV. Always forthright, frank and blunt, never shying away from speaking his mind, Ed Koch was both a delight and a challenge who forced us to be honest with ourselves and made every one of us better. And never wanting to leave the borough of Manhattan, which he loved, Ed Koch arranged to be buried in a special section of the cemetery of Trinity Church. The mayor, an American icon, an American treasure. Of him and of all for whom we pay tribute here, and any who may have died in this past year, al Kirush Hashem, sanctifying the name of heaven, including all who may have fallen in defense of the state of Israel or at the hands of those who inflict terror and death upon civilian families of Israel. The words of our tradition so aptly praise their work and their lives. Zecher Tzadik Livracha, the memory of the righteous is forever a blessing.